Hi, in this video I'm going to show you how to do an exploratory um, factor analysis, also known as EFA, in Stata software. Um, I'm going to do exploratory factor analysis, not principal components analysis, and so um, just make sure we want to clear that up. Exploratory factor analysis is done when you um, have the theory that there are underlying latent traits, and these underlying latent traits are causing response to the various um, items on a questionnaire or a survey and so forth, often Likert type items. So in this particular case, I've got a um, scale with 20 items. This is fictional data. You can follow along here. You see the data set I'm using. It's in the notes to this show if you want to download and follow along and try it for yourself. So I've got these 20 Likert type items and I'm going to do an exploratory factor analysis. So I'm going to find out um, what underlying subtraits or factors or subconstructs, however you want to call it, exist among these 20 items using the assumption that these underlying traits or subtraits or factors are what are causing the response to these items. So I'm going to do this. Um, and first, to start off with, I'm going to look at the summary statistics for these variables, which you always want to do when you're doing factor analysis. Um, be aware that the most important things to look at for um, these factors, or I mean for these items, is really the skewness and the kurtosis. And I can do that in Excel, I mean in Stata, using the sum command, listing the variable names here, um, whatever they are, just, that's a placeholder for the variable names, comma, detail. But the, the output that comes out isn't very concise, so I'm going to do it here in a way that gives it to me in one table. To do that, I'm going to use the tab stat command. So I'm going to do tab stat. That, I'm going to list my variables, and here I'm going to do it this way. You could list them one at a time, but I'm just going to tell it I want it scale item 1 to scale item 20. And then I'm going to do a comma, tell it which tells it I've got options to follow. And then I'm going to tell it specifically what statistics I want to look at. And I'm going to use the mean, the standard deviation, the skewness and the kurtosis. And you'll notice there that um, I have a space between each of those options, not commas. Those are the particular ones I want in the table. And then by default, it's going to give me a table that has rows as my statistics and columns my various, my 20 variables, which would be quite wide and cumbersome in this case. So I'm going to get use an additional option where I'm going to tell it the columns I want to represent the stats, the statistics, rather than the variables. So that's it. I've just typed that in and hit enter. And you'll see I get this concise table that pops up. Up, it gives me the mean, the standard deviation, the skewness, and the kurtosis for each of my variables. Now, this isn't a theory um, video, but I wanted to show you, tell you briefly what you're looking for. Means near the center, of course, will imply that you don't have a lot of um, skewness and you do want some standard deviation. You don't want this to be so tiny that it implies that everybody's responding the same way. As far as skewness, you want the absolute value of this um, of e for in each case to be generally less than 2. In other words, ignoring the negative sign, you want the values here to be generally less than 2. And you see I have some in the 1s, but I don't have anything that's really quite close to 2, so I don't worry about that. Kurtosis, you generally are looking for a cutoff around 7 or 8. Um, less um, anything greater than that would be extreme. Now, typically with Likert type items, if you have extreme um, kurtosis, you'll also have extreme skewness. You'll you often have both at the same time, which generally happens when you have a particular item that everybody's responding either the highest or lowest value to, the strongly disagree or the strongly agree, with just a couple maybe in the next category to it. So maybe most everybody is um, answering strongly agree and a few are answering agree. Most are fives with a few fours. So that's something that, that you want to be aware of. 
<clears throat> now, um, just as a quick comment here, we typically want to have at least five categories in our data to, to do exploratory factor analysis and our data fairly centered around the middle value, the mean, but that is again evaluated by the use of the skewness and the kurtosis. In this case, I'm fine. What do you do if one value is really extreme? Well, what I would do is I would go look at a histogram for that particular um, item, just type in um, hist, and then let's take one, the one that's our most extreme, in this case, scale 11. And that will pop up so that you can see exactly what's going on with your data. This is skewed, yes, obviously skewed. However, it's not so extremely skewed that it's a problem to do exploratory factor analysis. So I'm okay to go ahead. Um, I only care if it was really almost everybody's on one and a few on two, and you and that would be reflected in the values that I get in this summary statistics table here. So you see, in this case, it's not problematic. What would you do if it was problematic after you examine it? Probably you'd end up removing that item because what's happening is everybody's responding the same way. That that item provides no information. There's no variability. You'll also see a small, very small standard deviation here. And so if there's no variability, there is nothing to analyze, nothing to look at everybody's responding the same way. You may as well just have not asked them the question and put them all down as a strongly agree. There's no point in having that question on your scale, so you will probably would need to throw it out at time of analysis. Now again, it's not a theory video. This is more focused on showing you how to do it. Let's move on from here. The first thing, once you've checked this, is to look at how many factors you want to include. Now you may have some idea of how many, if you already know that you've got three factors and which items load on each one, then exploratory factor analysis isn't the right thing to be doing anyway. You should be doing confirmatory factor analysis. So most often with exploratory factor analysis, we may have some idea of the number of factors, but we don't have a solid theory about number of factors and which items load on factors. So I'm going to let statistics help rule it. This is an exploratory procedure. So I'm going to use some statistics. Now, there's a variety of rules that are used, um, or guidelines for the most part. And um, the first one that's most commonly used is number of eigenvalues greater than one. Now, what are eigenvalues? Eigenvalues are something mathematical that is extracted from the correlation matrix for all of these variables. You see here, if I were to make a correlation matrix for all of these variables, um, you see the, the correlations 2A, and um, what we're going to do is in exploratory factor analysis is find patterns in this, find groupings of items that go together because their correlations are all quite high. Well, this correlation matrix is also used to extract something called eigenvalues. It's a mathematical figure, and we're not going to um, show you how to find it mathematically here. That's beyond this video. But I will just mention that is a general measure of how many underlying factors or dimensions there are. If you had a situation in which every single item was correlated with every other very, very strongly. Um, so strongly, in fact, that once you hear the response to item one, you know exactly how they'll respond to all the other 19 items perfectly. In that case, you'd have um, perfect unidimensionality, which never happens. Um, all the item, you'd have one dimension or one factor perfectly. If that were the case, then because I have 20 items, I would have one eigenvalue that equaled 20 and the other 19 would be zero. In other words, all the variability or um, relationship among these 20 items is sucked up into one dimension. So that never happens. If that, but it, that would be one extreme. The other extreme would be all 20 of these items are perfectly independent of each other. The correlations between every pair is essentially zero. In that case, I have 20 underlying dimensions or 20 factors, and with 20 items, I would have 20 eigenvalues that exactly equaled 1. 
Now you'll notice in both of those cases, whether we have one eigenvalue that's 20 and the rest are zero, or 20 eigenvalues that all exactly equal one, those would all add up to 20. And that will always be the case with eigenvalues that you will get however many items you have, so 20 items, and they will all, all add up to that the end, the number, well, not the end, that would be number of people, and the number of columns or the number of um, items. So in this case, I will get 20 eigenvalues that add up to 20. And um, if, again, the, the one extreme is there was just one underlying factor, I will typically have one huge eigenvalue and the rest quite small. It never happens that I have one equal to 20 and then the others equal zero, but I might have something closer to that where I have one really big value and the other is quite small. And again, if I had lots of dimensions or if I had 20 dimensions, they would all equal one. That'll never happen either. If I had, um, but if say, say I had quite a few dimensions or underlying factors here, then I would have quite a few big eigenvalues that would be sucking up kind of what's going on here. And then the rest would be small. And so that kind of leads us to one of the main rules people use, which is number of eigenvalues greater than one. The idea is, say, if I had six eigenvalues greater than one and the rest less than one, then I would have about six factors here. Now, it's not the greatest rule in the world, and the reason it's not the greatest rule in the world is because it will often lead you to have more factors than are really interpretable. Some of them are, of uh, those underlying factors are just flukes due to similarities in wording um, across items, and so that's not generally the most helpful rule. Now, I will show you how to, to get those values, however, because we often use them as starting place, um, what we will typically do is we will do, do a factor analysis. They call it factor here. It's really a principal components analysis, but it gives you those eigenvalues kind of cleanly and in, in the easiest way. So I'm just going to type in here that I want to do factor um, scale item 1 to scale 20 using PCF method. And you'll get some output, just scroll up a little bit, and you'll see the eigenvalues listed in order of size. And notice they're 20. Yes, if you added those up, they would sum to the value 20 exactly, within rounding, I guess. And so here it looks like maybe there's five factors, okay, going by that rule, okay? Um, now, um, the next thing that is often done, often with eigenvalues, one easy thing is we make something called a scree plot. All you have to do is type in scree. Now that has to be done after you run that last command that we just did. You can't just do it on its own, you'll get an error. You have to run factor analysis first. And what you'll see here is this plot. It's really just um, a plot of the side that is actual values. So the first value was six point something, the next was just under two, the next was this and so forth in order. So this scale here is just, just a the order scale, the, the first to the 20th eigenvalue. And one guideline that's often helpful is to look at um, the point at which the eigenvalues pretty much hit a straight line. So you can see right here, right about the third eigenvalue, they pretty much fall on a straight line. If that's the case, then we would say that we have number of factors starting one less than that. So I have two real factors, the rest of these aren't really real factors. So that's another simple guideline that is used. There are some others that are used. Um, one, The most um, reputable is called parallel analysis, but that's beyond what I'm going to show in this video, maybe at another time in another video. I'm going to use two um, factors here based on that eigenvalue rule. In order to do that, I'm just going to go back to my factor command and I'm going to tell it the items I want, scale 1 to scale 20, comma. Now what I'm going to do is tell it ML. I want maximum likelihood. There's other options. Um, you can go to help, parentheses, factor, if you want to see some of the other options that are available. But this is the most commonly used approach. Okay, so I've got ML. So I'm telling I want to use maximum likelihood. And... Um, and then I'm going to tell it how many factors I want. I'm going to do FA, which is short for factors, and just put in parentheses 2. If I don't put anything there, by default it will 
give me the number of factors as I have eigenvalues values greater than one, so about five of them in this case. I don't want that. So I hit enter. Now, I'm, again, this isn't a theory video, but I want you to understand this is the unrotated solution, so it makes things a little harder to interpret here. We're going to clarify the solution by rotating it in multidimensional space in such a way that we can cleanly see um, the, the, you know, clean uh, the distinction between the two factors. And in order to do that, I just use the command rotate, comma, and then I tell it how I want it to rotate. Now, there's two ways. Um, orthogonal rotation means I'm rotating them in such a way that I want to make these factors as uncorrelated with each other as possible. Um, and often when we do that, we use um, the Verimax option. That's the most commonly used one. Okay. It's not really reasonable when you have social science data. Generally, un underlying traits or sub subtraits, factors, subconstructs, whatever you wish to call them, are correlated with each other generally for humans. So we generally use um, oblique rotation, which allows the various factors to be correlated. And I'm going to do that here. There are many options here, but Promax is one that's commonly used, and it's one that I like to use. And we'll go ahead and hit enter. And you will see now, this is, you can see rotated factor loadings or pattern matrix. You can see all the loadings here. Now you'll notice it's quite cluttery to look at. We um, generally will say it's a strong loading when it's 0.7 or higher. Um, one guideline is that it's a not a substantial enough of a loading to really say, a, say that item is loaded on that factor. If it's less than 0.32, often people will use that level. Some people might be stricter, say 0.3 or 0.2. And um, we can um, revise the prior command in such a way that we blank out all those ones that are left less than any threshold we want so that it's cleaner to look at. And often results are even published in that way. So I'm going to just click back on that prior command. I'm going to do BL, which stands for blanks, and I'm going to tell it what value I want blanks below. Maybe I want blanks below the 0.32 threshold. It doesn't do any recalculation. It doesn't change anything. It just m removes them from our view if they are less than 0.32 so that we can more easily interpret our findings. And when I do that, you see that I've got um, all my loadings here and it actually in this with this fictional data loads fairly cleanly um, with half the or a little more than half the items loading on factor one and the rest loading on factor two so that's really the end of the statistical analysis we would do here maybe what i would do next is i would look at the wordings of all these items i don't have wordings because this is fictional data i would look at the wordings of these particular items to see whether this solution is inter is interpretable and makes sense okay if it does not then maybe i need to consider a different number of factors and see whether a different number of factors is more interpretable or more useful to you than the number of factors i have here and um, so you may go back um, to this line item seven here and try it with three or some something else if this solution isn't interpretable to you Keep in mind when you want to interpret the factor, you want to give the greatest weight to the meaning of the items with the highest loadings. So these higher values here would be the ones I look at first, and the ones that are negative are ones that are going to be opposite in meaning. So if they someone um, put strongly disagree on that, item, it would be equivalent to putting strongly agree on the items that are positive. So you, those are items that probably have some kind of reverse meaning to them. Okay, so if this was self-esteem, then these items would be ones that were, you know, self, the opposite of that. They were, you know, said things like, I generally hate myself kind of items. So that's an overview of, of how we look at exploratory factor analysis here in Stata.